Hey everybody, earlier this year I started doing a series here on YouTube, Catastrophe and Cartography, and the whole point of that series was to give you guys tools which will allow you to explore the planet in a lot of detail. And I did a video on the Carolina Bays, and the foundation of that video was some LiDAR imagery that you can overlay in Google Earth. And the guy who did that, Michael Davius, is joining me today. He's put in a lot of hard work to make that available for everybody. And he's also got a really interesting theory on how the Carolina Bays were formed that differs from the theory I offered in that video. So I thought I'd get him on here. He can explain how he does all that amazing LiDAR data. And he's also going to explain a little bit about his theory. So Michael, if you want to take it away. Uh, greetings. Thank you very much for the uh, intro. I, I, I'm excited to have an opportunity to discuss about these two facets together because they are very tightly entwined. Uh, I developed the... Um, visual presentation of the topography of the earth uh, for presentation in Google Earth specifically to help me uh, pursue my primary goal, which is to try to characterize Carolina Bays far more accurately than they've been able to be characterized historically. And to do that, I've slowly developed and put out this process. And I, I must say that the vast majority of my work in the last year has been to expand that mapping all the way across the country. I'm up to uh, the Rocky Mountains right now. And I hope to within a year or so have for the most of the United States where there's high resolution LIDAR. Uh, but going back to the motivation, I've been working on the Carolina Bays for 15 years now. And my first introduction to them was in North Carolina. I was visiting a museum and they had these big, huge posters on it uh, that showed these Carolina Bays in downtown Richmond. Uh, and I turned to my two daughters who were with me. One was a one was a physicist out of Brown University, and the other one was studying um, aquatics at uh, North Carolina State. And the the physicist says, "Yeah, they're they're round lakes or whatever." My my daughter says, "Well, that's interesting because that's where I do all my work on on uh, striped bass, and I run my boat on that lake all the time, and I've never heard anybody call it Carolina Bay." I said, well, this is really strange. We have these things that got names, but nobody knows what they are. So the first thing I picked up was a paper by uh, three geologists in North Carolina who were looking at a ridge in North Carolina they called the Goldsboro Ridge. And they're the only people who have ever done a full cross-section set of cores down, down through all the sediments, down into the well-dated uh, marine sediments, both across the ridge and along the ridge for kilometers in length, uh, maybe 50 holes. So they did a lot of work. And what they were doing is in the process of about 10 papers, they looked at this type of areas all across the Carolinas, because they knew this sand in this dune, this long ridge was unusual. And we're trying to characterize where this sand came from. And they had looked along slopes in valleys on hilltops, they were looking at this ridge. And what they continue to find out is that these things had Carolina Bays in them. But when they tried to discriminate between the Carolina Bay and the sand, that was the body of sand that they were looking at. Eventually in uh, 1977, the first sentence of their paper stated, asserted that Carolina Bays were formed during the final depositional phase of the sediments they are found within. I says, well, that's interesting. I've never heard that approach to Carolina Bays before. Now, it's documented in six papers. They're very well-known geologists. Uh, soil geomorphologist uh, Raymond Daniels wrote the textbook on soil geomorphology, and you can still buy it for 60 bucks on the web. So they were, the cores are gone, but I'm sitting there saying, well, where did the sand come from? And they did too. They, it couldn't be marine. It couldn't be windblown because it's too coarse. It can't be it can't be marine sediments because there's absolutely no fossils with us ever in it. There's no clay in it. So it's kind of hard to be a, you know, water deposited thing, a fluvial thing. So they went through it and they could usually find this case that kind of fit in a different locale, but they could not find one case that would fit all of these places that the Carolina Bays were. That's the only thing they could discover is that it was probably, the bays were probably formed in the last phase of the position of the sediment. So I said, so, what is this weird sediment and why is the deposit of it not known? I mean, it's across, I say today, it's across the vast majority of North America. And every place people go to it, they are quizzed. The geologists are quizzical about what this soil is. It's regolith, it's, it's um, 
a residuum, but th there's no fossils in it. It usually sets on surfaces that they understand are there because uh, they can date it with fossils, but something in the last 3 million years put all the sediment across North America. Now, I immediately jumped and said, well, the only thing I know that could spread a blanket of sediment across all of North America is a massive impact, sending out just waves of sand and debris flowing out like a, a big wave going across the whole continent, spreading that all across the continent. And, and I just proposed that that was the depositional method of it and that the Carolina Bays are nothing more than little dimples in the surface of that when, they, when it got painted. And if you've ever done any painting and you're really sloppy about it, you get all these little bubbles and those little bubbles break and you get basically a little basin. Um, and it may only be a couple of micrometers thick, but if the blanket was actually 10 meters thick, all you need is about three meters of a bubble and you're gonna wind up having a hydraulically closed basin. Now I was stuck then at trying to find out where the impact was. I went through that, through some orientation stuff. That's what I used to, the mapping for is to measure all the Carolina Bays and measure their orientation accurately. And using Google Earth, a whole bunch of tools to take that. And I proposed the Saginaw Bay of Michigan back in 2010, I proposed that. Uh, now that has taken some activity outside of me. I mean, that's, people have run away with that saying that the Carolina Bays, the YDB impact was in Saginaw, but I've never said that. I've never supported that. And it's, uh, as I told Peter earlier, it's probably one of my biggest obstacles in pushing my theory is the relationship with the YDB is used by so many people um, that I can't get them to think about my process. Um, <clears throat> but so the rest of that conversation is about 2014, uh, my research partner came to me and said, Mike, Mike, I, I, I forget that crater. I can't, there's this crater that's someplace in, Aust in, Aust in uh, Indochina that created these Australasian tektites and everybody is looking for the crater and nobody can find it. And it's gotta be in this pile of horse stuff here someplace. So everybody's looking there, he's looking at it. And I said, well, that's interesting. And Tim was really enthusiastic about it because after 50 years, the scientists have been looking at these tektites, the little pieces of molten glass. Uh, and they know that they've gone through a manufacturing process that started with a cosmic impact onto the planet into sandy sediments um, or shale, um, sandstone, gray whack type stuff, the, the scientific term. And they know that that stuff was laid down as a sedimentary strata on a continent someplace about 200 million years ago. And because of that, they know that, and the sediment because of, of, of some contents of it, some of the chemistry was eroded out of a pluton of solid granite or something that was about 1.6 billion years ago but they can't find this place. I said, Tim, you've just described the sediments of the Michigan intercratonic basin that I say is missing because of the impact at Saginaw Bay. That's exactly the sediments that got brought up out of that area that disappeared um, from a cosmic impact. So I said, but that's too far away and it's too old. And I've already talked with Peter about the old part about it. I, I was already at like 200 to 300,000 years old. But I took a hard look at it. I took a look at Tim's evidence about how Saginaw Bay area of Michigan, Lake Huron would be a perfect epicenter for distributing, tech, distributing tektites all the way to Indochina, um, which, and that entire story has been encapsulated with a paper that the GSA recently published, a nice 30 page paper that Tim and I co-authored. Uh, it's in their special publications book, uh, five, five, three, uh, and it's chapter 24. And Tim has chapter 25, which is his dissertation on how to do suborbital modeling to get from Saginaw to Indochina. Um, his paper is actually free and it's basically free because you may have heard of Walter Alvarez. Walter Alvarez looked for 10 years with his father struggling to get people to believe that there was a cosmic impact 65 million years ago that killed the dinosaurs. Well, of course, that was laughed at for a lot of, by a lot of people, 
primarily because he didn't have a crater. Uh, he had all the evidence that one occurred, when it occurred. And when we finally got some oil drilling um, samples out of the Chicklub area of the Yucatan, we found where the crater was and he was justified then, but he had a long 10 years of trying to prove uh, that there was an impact. Walter Alvarez wrote some, a paper on how to do suborbital modeling. Um, and he was intrigued by what Tim had done to make it much more available to the general public to use. And he is one of the reviewers that approved the publication of the papers. So uh, we've got some great um, minds on our side that Saginaw is a location that everything could have gotten to the Indochina area. And the scientists who do impact uh, science, the specialists, are very, very positive that the impact that created the Australasian tectite strewn field with all these tectites in it has to be in Indochina. Now, they estimate that there's over 60 billion tons of these tectites. Uh, and that's only in the little tiny ones that are in the ocean cores where they have drilled and found the ocean cores and the, that area, including um, on the surface in Antarctic uh, is about a third of the world. And if you just simply look at that density alone, there must've been that much, let alone the, the macro tech types that people collect out of Indochina, which are, you can buy a handful for 10 bucks. They're so come out common. <clears throat> they think that impact has to be in that area. And the irony of it is, uh, and I gave a talk at the GSA uh, impact meeting um, session at the GSA in Denver uh, a few months ago, uh, where I shared with those folks the fact that there are five impacts that created tectites. In every one of those cases, the impact is far, far away from where the tectites were found typically in an asymmetric direction and separated by a great distance. They're trying to say that in this one case, there's four that's, that's the case. They're saying in this one case, the tectites have to be right where the impact crater was. In spite of the fact for 50 years, they've been looking for it and they haven't found it. And it must be a huge crater. So how in the world, they're, they're, you know, so that's a falsification for our hypothesis is that they actually find the crater. Um, they const every, every six months, there's another, uh, there's another proposal and they all come up empty. So, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm enthused about that. It ties off the impact in North America at 800,000 years ago, right at the mid Pleistocene transition where uncharacteristically, a lot of things happen at the mid Pleistocene transition. That's why they call it a transition. Sometimes it's called mid Pleistocene revolution. There's so much happened, but when you look at all, and this is covered in the paper also, when you look at all the aspects of what happened at the mid Pleistocene, no one ever considers the fact that there was a major cosmic impact at that moment. They never tie it off. They always go looking at, uh, you know, the the the, the um, Milankovic cycles for the climate, um, uh, the the global. Ice Age, it was, we were in MIS-20 at that moment, we're coming out of MIS-20. All those things were creating all the stuff that they're looking at. They're not considering that it was a cosmic impact that could justifiably, justifiably be related to all of those types of things that happened, including climate change. So that's the wrapper on the, 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 uh, the paper and the hypothesis. It's in there as a hypothesis. Our falsification is to go back to the maps find the places where there's Carolina Bay deposits and go down 10 meters, 15 meters down into the ground, down to the known sediment basins, uh, sedimentary layers and do some uh, fancy cosmogenic um, isotope dating technology. Uh, it's beryllium aluminum specifically that can actually tell when a known surface was buried by a lot of sediment. Uh, and they've been using that uh, in the last 10 years, they finally, they finally ate, able to put an exact age on where each of the glacial ice ages since two and a half million years ago, there's been one, a lot of regular glacial ice ages and a lot of moraines all the way across from uh, Canada, all the way down to St. Louis um, at different times, but they've never known when those occurred. Now they've got a date for every one of those moraine surfaces 
which was the, the farthest south extent of that ice age. Um, and of course, since 800,000 years ago, those ice ages are all 100,000 years apart. Before that, they were 41 or 21,000 years apart. So that's one of the big changes at the mid-Pleistocene revolution. We want to go out and use our mapping to find places where we can me measure those sediments and the falsification premise for the hypothesis that if it doesn't support that across the continent, there was a large deposit of sediments everywhere, uh, up on top of the Ozarks, um, down in river valleys, uh, along the coastal plains where the bays are, all those locations should be showing this characteristic that it's non no fossils in it, it's uh, coarse sandstones and, and sand and pebbles and uh, just sitting there on the ground <clears throat> that they can't date. And if all that dates haven't wound up on the ground 800,000 years ago, it'll prove the hypothesis. Uh, that process is gonna take millions of dollars and lots of PhD students work, which is one of the reasons that GSA was interested in publishing the paper because they think that could actually help uh, motivate just to pr prove it, to disprove my hypothesis. By, by doing that, they could find out the ages of all these sediments on, on our, own, our own continent that we don't know what the, how old they are or how they got there. So um, that's the motivation for doing it. Now, going back to the, to the LIDAR, um, um, as I was mentioning, I was trying to measure the bays. And one way to measure the bays is to use Google Earth uh, to find in just satellite photos and draw, just draw a Google Earth, you can draw a line and measure the size of something. Um, and that's, that's very tedious as uh, also because they're oval, you got to figure out which the, if I was looking for orientation, I got to figure out what the major axis is. So, um, so Peter, I don't, do you, do you want to do a little discussion about the, how I make the LIDAR. And... Yeah, I think it'd be interesting if you can show people the actual process and give them some insight into that because it's going to be a lot of work, I imagine. This is the Cape Fear River Valley. Um, and you can see on here, I've got a little whole bunch of place marks. And those place marks are nothing more than a Google Earth place mark. Um, and I've measured these bays. And if you click on a place mark, it actually gives you I don't know if you can, you have to have a big screen to probably read this, but um, give some of the metrics of the basin. So what I was doing is measuring these basins uh, with a technology called uh, Google Earth. It's called a plan form overlay. It's basically an image and you can place images in Google Earth using these ground overlays. You just give it, um, move it up here where you can see it. You just give it a name for the image. These are, this happens to be a PNG file. And it's just basically a, a, a raster image that I've created that is basically started with being a pure oval. And in Adobe Illustrator, I munged the oval so that it fit pretty well on what I say is a characteristic of a Carolina Bay. And in this area, I call them the Bay Carolinas, and they're all exactly the same. Now, the beauty of this is, if I continue on to this, so you notice I can, I can move this around. If I wanted to measure another bay, I could very easily just draw it over here and then go in and use this overlay, just changing the length and width and map over it and then change, turn it like this. I could, if it's the orientation changes and I've measured another bay. Now, how have I measured it? If I take this out, if you look over here, um, this is, this is the basin I've been working with. Uh, if I do okay on that and I go back, I can copy that out, just simply copy it. If you copy that out of there, it's a bunch of text. It's XML text. And with the XML text, I can recreate the length and width of this object as it currently sits on Google Earth and the rotation from due north. Now, the, these, these originally are brought in uh, with the arrow pointing directly north, like that, so that as I as I move and start directly north, go back and put it back over here. As I rotate this around with this rotation handle, I'm increasing the orientation of it uh, so that it comes back to where it's supposed to be. 
there's a lot of subjective stuff here, especially when the basins overlay each other. But this gets me close enough, you know, subjectively. And I can very quickly measure a couple hundred bays an hour this way uh, using this measuring tool. Now, but what I need below there, I need a very high resolution image of the ground. If I go, if I go to this area, yeah. So, so if I turn off my LIDAR presentation on Google Earth, you can see in this area that you can probably measure these bays pretty well um, just by the same technique. I come up here and I could pretty much measure this basin just in Google Earth. And originally, back 15 years ago, this is all I had. And it, but it still worked pretty well. I mean, you've got a pretty good rendition of what this basin looks like. Where it breaks down a little bit is if you come down to this like little Singletary Lake here where um, the you can actually see the basin rim, but the water is not, doesn't fill the whole basin. This is all floating organics, same thing for here. So there are places that trees or organics or uh, drainage cut into and, and eroded the basin uh, or farmlands might have obstructed me to use it. So. I did a lot of basins. I probably measured my first 15,000 bays using this technique without the LIDAR. Then I became aware of the LIDAR. And charmingly, the state of North Carolina was the first U.S. state to get their entire state measured with LIDAR back in uh, 2006, uh, from 2004 to 2006. So by 2010, we, we started getting available LIDAR from this whole area. It was very early in the technology. Uh, they've since reflown it in the, in the teens uh, and got some better data. They will probably wind up doing it again in another three years to get even better, higher quality resolutions. What I've done with this is, and, and if, uh, uh, if you take advantage of the kit that, uh, the link that Peter has put out there about loading this, this, this LIDAR, anybody can load it into their Google Earth presence by simply going to a web page and clicking a link and bringing a starter file in. And that starter file is looks like this. It's uh, it just uh, it says Carolina Base Survey. This happens to be the 2.9 development version of it, but uh, you'll get something that's uh, it's got a link. Um, this one up here is the link. This is what's currently published, the V 2.8. I don't have Florida. I don't have New England and I don't have the Rocky Mountains. What I'm currently working on is the 2.9 version. Uh, and um, intrinsic in the first thing that loads, uh, the first thing that gets hit is, I call it a heat map. The heat map shows a light white area. Uh, and you can see that. So I, where I, I'm, I'm picking up this Rocky Mountain area here currently and down into New Mexico and the Southern area of Texas, which isn't on the current one. Uh, and I'll be adding the New England over here and down here. What what this heat map gives me, us is based on those 15 minute or quarter degree by quarter degree quadrants. You can see them here. This is a uh, this is Augusta West. So this is the one degree quadrant of Augusta West. There's 16 of these 15 minute sub quadrants, and in each one of them, um, the basin the bays I've measured are. Uh, put forth in out in the heat map, it just gives you a basic idea of the number of them. So you can find out the density. It's really logarithmic because some of these might only have one or two. Um, but when it gets really red, these are the areas with very high resolution. Uh, by the way, again, uh, the concept of trying to load this so it doesn't blow people out of the water. As you zoom in, I, you can see I have no LIDAR here loaded yet because it would take too much to even load the the lowest resolution LIDAR. And I don't have all the basins shown. I, at this level, I only have the top 10% of the basins in a quadrant. Uh, so as you move in, uh, you'll start to see the LIDAR loading and you will start to see more basins, uh, the, uh, the place marks for them. And you, there are even more basins as you zoom in further. This is only the top 50%. As you move in further, it picks pick up all the smaller ones like that one just popped up. These here uh, will drop out if you pull out a little bit because you don't want to overload the screen with, you can only really put about 500 each of these elements on a screen at a time before it slows things down. So that's all part of the triage going on 
<clears throat> in the uh, KMZ file to keep this from uh, slowing your machine down. Do you have a rough estimate of how many bays you've mapped so far? Yes, there's uh, about 67,000 with a caveat. Peter, we were talking earlier about the bays that are, are, <laughs> that are pirated. Um, most of these bays are very holistically. They're on the flat surfaces. They're no debate about being a Carolina Bay. But as you move farther inland, uh, it's possible to get a lot of areas that the basins aren't all that crisply defined. Uh, and it's hard to justify that they're basins. There's probably only about half that in real holistically, hydraulically closed, uh, flat floored Carolina Bays. The rest of them, a lot of them are indeed only partially there and only interpreted by me as being basins. Also, currently uh, in the current inventory, uh, you'll find it's not the one that you see out there on the on the web right now, but this is the area in Texas Panhandle called uh, the High Plains. And here I'm measuring these constructs that are considered High Plains playas. Um, and they may or may not be brethren of the Carolina Bays, but they sure seem to be to me because they are hydraulically closed basins on a flat level surface. And they are perhaps not orientated as robustly as the Carolina Bays are, but they all have this characteristic uh, shape to them. It's very easy to put this characteristic shape on them and see it work out. Um, this is actually pretty interesting because this area includes a very big city called Amarillo, Texas. And Amarillo, Texas is built basically in one of these playas to talk about the size of these structures. That's not visible on the ground. Again, my high resolution topography map, the color map I use over here on the left, it, every 10 meters, it cycles through the colors. So you can say that this area here is 10 meters above this blue area down in here. So it's only a, ton, a 10 meter elevation change. And the distance, if we go to Google Earth and measure the distance uh, from blue to blue, that's a half a kilometer and it's only 10 meters uh, distance. So you can't, you can very rarely see these uh, items on the ground by the, by the, by the human eye. Uh, and it's very hard sometimes to see them. If we get rid of the LIDAR, they just disappear. You might see a little bit of residual here. I put it back on again, this area right here. Yep, you can kind of see it, but it'd be very hard to map that without the LIDAR. Uh, so these, uh, there's about 6,000 that I've measured right now, but there's probably another 50,000 in the High Plains areas, but I've yet to map them all. Yeah, that's amazing because one of the things that people don't seem to realize is that our landscape all around us is just covered in these wounds, if you will, from these catastrophes. And without things like LIDAR, it's very hard to even see a lot of them. And, and Peter, one of the other things that come out of this, I, I call it the annulus. As we populate this, there's 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 bays in Kansas, there's bays throughout this area. There's kind of a, a hiatus right down in this area here of Arkansas and Mississippi and Texas. Uh, but that we view as being downstream from from Saginaw. So we, we have a we're expecting this type of flight line, uh, and we're expecting to put out. Uh, they, they call it a butterfly is what the, uh, the astrophysics call it, a butterfly displacement of sediments uh, on either side in a butterfly. And it, it, it charmingly, it kind of mapping into that right now. So, but again, that's, <laughs> that would only be a falsification if it didn't happen. It doesn't really prove anything since it is, could just be a, could just be a coincidence. So just to uh, clarify then for people that might just be kind of new to the channel or they're not too familiar with this whole idea, what, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're suggesting is that about 800,000 years ago, you had a very large impact into the Laurentide ice sheet, which the structure of that impact would have since been more or less erased due to the continual glacial interglacial cycles. And during that impact, you created not only the Carolina Bays, but also the Australasian tectite field, correct? Yes. On top of that, you know, one of the, the criticisms I had of that idea was that 
a lot of these bays look fairly new. In other words, they don't seem to be as heavily eroded if they're 800,000 years old. But you've explained that a bit in your paper if you want to tell people how, in terms of the gradients and how the fact that there are bays that are very substantially eroded, if you want to get into some of that. Okay. Um, yes. I, uh, so I did put this up here. This is kind of a, this is, this is literally 12 years old, this image. <laughs> um, and uh, it isn't in the paper, but this kind of shows where I was working at the time. Obviously, it's, maybe it's expanded a little bit, a little south and a little bit wider. And also, maybe not even annulus. I'm finding on, up, on highlands outside the glacial margin. Now, they're not going to expect to find any that are under the glacier because anything of these blankets that blanketed the glacier uh, isn't going to, they may have created a Carolina Bay on the glacier, but certainly when the glacier eroded away, it would have destroyed any of the representation of a Carolina Bay. But while I'm at it here, I, I wanted to put up in the Michigan here. One of the things I, that is in the paper uh, is this is the common bedrock map of uh, Michigan. Uh, and these are the most recent sediments. Uh, the the gray is the, uh, they call it the cold water shale. And in through the Michigan sandstones and the um, the Bayport limestone is this purple, this, this uh, hot green blue here, uh, all the way up to Jurassic uh, and pink here. So these are the areas that I say are, are all missing. And we're proposing a uh, impact that comes in from the upper right through the lower left and basically grazing the earth, basically digging a ditch, as it were, through these layers. And basically the components of Australasian tektites are made up forensically of parental material that, that match what is missing in this area here. The reality is, is nobody knows what, and this is the, the again, mystery stuff here. Saginaw Bay sits there. Saginaw Bay creates what's called Michigan's thumb. But if you go and look into all of literature, Michigan's thumb, what created it, there is no attempt or has been no attempt to qualify why that happened. And this is why it's a mystery. If you look at the way the, the Michigan Basin formed, it formed as intercratonic, it slowly sank. Why it sank, they don't know. But as it sank, it backfilled in like a set of bowls. They're all interstacking bowls. Uh, so it goes back down about five kilometers down where some of the Cretaceous foundation is. Uh, but over 500 million years, it filled in and each area is smaller and smaller as, as, it, as it stopped filling in. So the, the last infill was probably in the Jurassic or the Permian. During the glacial ice ages, the ice coming down from the north flowed around this core to create Huron, flowed around the core to do Lake Michigan, flowed this way down uh, Erie, but bypassed this, or should I say was re rejected by this very, very hard sediment. These are, it was after we started forming cemented sediments. They're very, very hard. They don't erode easily. Everything in the basin outside this area, the older stuff is all easily eroded. This part does not erode easily at all. Uh, so every place, the glaciers were rejected from eroding this and the glaciers just rode over this, hundreds of feet above where the rest of the landscape is. The glaciers rode over this and didn't remove this hard bedrock sandstones. So the question is, what created that? What created Saginaw Bay? I'd like to think that if I have a, uh, anything in the end, people look at this 50 years from now after I'm gone and say, why didn't I see an impact crater there? It should have been this, we got this, we have no reason why it's that, you know. So, um, but that, that has yet to be proven. But that's one of my, one of the things that keep me sane is that this here does not belong. And I went out to try to falsify my idea that Saginaw Bay was the impact site by looking at this stuff. And just simply by looking at the map, it, it, to me, it supports the idea that something strange happened here. And it will take matching of the Australasian tektites components to this, the, these sandstones and shales, all the SRRB and all the high-end chemistry that can do it to prove that this indeed was the source or can't be falsified as being the source. It may not prove anything, but uh, I don't think it can be falsified.
But yes, Peter, you're, I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent on there. Your, your conversation about basins and, and where they are um, and how they eroded, I'm going to take you to Richmond, Virginia. Uh, I was there a little earlier with you, there, Peter. And uh, where I was looking at is this thing right here called Windsor Farms, which was basically a community built in the in this early 19th century as a whole bunch of little beautiful little homes. You know, if you go there, uh, you can you can find all these little pretty homes. They center green and a church, um, really kind of nice little area to live in. Uh, except if you go there after a major rainstorm, you'll find all these streets flooded. They're flooded because it's enclosed by a hydraulically closed Carolina Bay. There's, there are other bays on, they call this Melothian platform. Um, and some of them are pretty heavily eroded. Uh, you can see how the streams have come up into here. And these things drain all the way down and around and out to the James River, which is nearby. This is the James River. Uh, it's down quite a bit. Uh, the elevation here is 57 meters. The elevation at the river is 36. Uh, up here, we're at 102 down there is 36. So it's about 70 meters, uh, 210 feet up from the river to this area. And this whole realm here has been eroded down into the river. And along this, I call it a fortification. If you look at where the, the flat levels at the top, the single colors uh, are your sign that this is relatively flat areas, you can see that there's a fortification here that's keeping this area from being eroded. And those fortifications are Carolina Bay rims. They've stopping it from happening. Now it probably happened here. This probably got eroded out. Um, this one here is being eroded out. This was probably a Carolina Bay that got eroded out. So I'm looking at places with high relief, bays do get captivated over 800,000 years and basically erode out. And I imagine in another 200,000 years, this whole territory will all be eroded out like it is over here, and you won't find any Carolina Bays. But the bay I want to show you is this one right here. Now, this is, this is a beauty. Look at, look at the size of this thing. This is um, 1.7 kilometers in diameter. And this one's in Virginia, correct? Yeah, this is just in, just outside of Richmond, Virginia. So if you look at this, and you certainly you, you, you turn off the... You, you turn off the LIDAR, you're not going to find a Carolina Bay there, right? And why would there be? Because it's, it doesn't hold, it hasn't hold water. The question is, how long ago did that thing hold water? They say that the James River, three million years ago, came across the surface and deposited all these sediments. So it took three million years for the river to erode down to this level. This is still here. So that's 3 million years of erosion coming up into here. This erosion didn't happen in 12,000 years. This erosion probably happened uh, maybe 200,000 200, years ago from an event that happened 800,000 years ago when all these bays were created. That's just an example of how many bays exist, like this one here and this one here, that actually have been the term that the USGS uses is pirated. These are pirated Carolina Bays, little tiny one here. They're everywhere. Uh, and they show that they're not normally counted when you're looking at Carolina Bays. Now, for instance, uh, uh, this is, I'm just gonna do this here. This is crazy. Um, I just saw something. I do this all the time. Now, it, it's a stretch, but if I stretch, <laughs> I can see that that shape can be mapped around, I'm gonna turn it just a little bit here, can be mapped around all these highland areas, the areas of solid color all the way around. Um, and, and I have them over here too in, in Richmond. Richmond, the city itself is built potentially into a pirated Carolina Bay. This is city center right here. It may just be a coincidence that that is, a, you know, that, that it has that kind of shape. Um, but if I turn it off, it does kind of jump out at you as having that characteristic of what a Carolina Bay rim set looks like. It's certainly circular there up to the northern end to the west too. Right, right. And then, uh, you know, same thing over here, just just a little further to the east. Um, there's two more that fit the same description. 
by the way, while we're over here, this, this is Bayes one. These are the top 10% of the Bayes. If you look at this uh, table over here, here's the one uh, quarter degree uh, high resolution topography map uh, link. So you can turn them off there. And then in the L2 Bayes, this is the, if there's less than 200 Bayes in an area, this is the next, uh, the next 90% uh, of Bayes. But these here, these are all the big ones. Uh, you're not going to see that as being a bay. But again, if you look at the LIDAR, you just, <laughs> again, I, I have to say, I, I try to recognize my own propensity to see things, but I see this rim here and I see this rim here. And if I put them together, I see, I see that rim following around and, and potentially look at this over here being a Carolina Bay rim. Uh, there's a little tiny segment of one right here. And I didn't, I didn't measure it, but these, these little tentacles shouldn't exist on, on this map, but they do. So this is an eroded Carolina Bay. Um, in any given area at the edges of the terrace that has the bays on, that hasn't been eroded out or eviscerated by, by sheet erosion or stream erosion, you're going to find these uh, basins that are that look for everything like a Carolina Bay, except they're being invaded eventually, and eventually they'll be eroded away. To I won't even be able to map them. I didn't map that one. I mean, so there's got to be millions of Carolina Bays, if you, especially if you include some of these really heavily eroded ones. Correct? Yeah, yeah, like this one right here. I didn't, I didn't measure that, um, and I should have. That that um, you know, go through that little process here, just because uh, this is. How I get, whenever I get really depressed about the progress of my work, <laughs> I say, let's just go do this. And I, I, I measure another 20 bays in an area I never had bays before. Well, this has got me thinking because one of the things I've seen in my studies on Google Earth is that there are definite crater alignments in a perfectly straight line. And very often those craters are completely different dating, which leads me to think that what if you had multiple impacts in the same exact orientation onto the Laurentide ice sheet over the span of, let's say, 100,000 to a million years even? Could that, assuming that hypothesis is correct, you could have Carolina Bays with different ages then, which might explain some of the discrepancies that we're seeing. Is that plausible? Well, for the Carolina Bays, yes. For this event, it was a singular, well, I shouldn't say that again. Let's talk about it. The, Austral the Australasian tektites are known to be 788,000 plus two minus 1,000 years ago. Very, very accurate dating because they've been looked at for 50 years now. That is only one of four impact events out of 200 known impacts that created tektites. So, um, but that said, there also are tektites in Panama and uh, the Panama area of uh, Belize that seem to have the same age, but might be a little bit different. So they're not including them. Now, Tim and I have the opinion that, yeah, right. Why would they include them in the same batch? Because even though they ha have almost exactly the same date, they're all the way over on the Eastern hemisphere. They can't have anything to do with the Australasian tectites. Uh, that may change if this gets accepted and they will probably come into the family. But there are so few of those events um, the Chesapeake Bay impact created them 35 million years ago. The ones that are found in Georgia and Texas is an impact in Germany, in Reese, Germany. Uh, they created tectites in Czechoslovakia and Poland. That's the Moldavites, right? The green ones? The Moldavites, yep. Yeah. Um, and um, that's where we first got the, the mold of <laughs> the term tectite means molten glass in, in Latin. So, um, uh, that's kind of where they got the, but of course, at that time, they had no idea where tectites came from. That was, that was a whole debate. That will, <laughs> I'm sure has been, has been revisited by people trying to come up with some other explanations for the debate, but uh, it took 50 years of work to prove that they were actually cosmic impacts because most of that 50 years, people didn't believe there were such things as cosmic impacts. So how could it be a cosmic impact? So what do you think caused the bays themselves. I know Antonio Zamora thinks it's ice boulders. I think Randall Carlson might suggest that they were air bursts from a, a disintegrating comet, kind of like Tunguska. What do you think it was? 
Well, um, the, the hypothesis put, puts a couple suggestions forward. I mean, Tim, my, my research partner, Tim, has some different, different concepts than I do. Uh, but what I have always worked with, uh, and it, it seems to be it's what's most explained in the paper, is that there were probably, uh, start with a 10 kilometer high wave blasting out from Michigan that is 10% sediments and 90% water vapor. And as it spread across the continent, the lower surfaces of it contacted the ground and left a blanket or multiple blankets of sediments uh, from one to 10 meters thick. It is these sediments that the Carolina Bays are formed in. Uh, these are the ones that don't have any fossils. How could they have any fossils? Uh, uh, if they did, they'd be pretty fragmented. Um, but they do know that in the areas lower, in any kind of coring, that they do know this is the eastern shore of Virginia. It's pretty well described when this all got, this peninsula got built. Uh, and speaking of impact craters, of course, the Chesapeake Bay impact crater is right in the middle of all this. It's why all, this, all these streams flow to it because there was a big hole here. So this obviously didn't exist there. Where they, drug, where they dug a, a hole for the main central rise is right around here, I think, uh, Fairview, someplace in this area where they dug uh, the core. And that's a great core. Um, but they, have the, they, they know from marine sediments where each, when each one of these, or fluvial sediments from the Chesapeake Bay, uh, overflowing it when most of these sediments were formed. They don't, and they have OSL dates for the highest, you know, the highest meter of sands here, because this has all been reworked. I've proposed that these rims are actually artifacts at the surface of something that is far, much farther down, maybe 10, 15 meters down. And it's been maybe covered over by dust and aeolian deposits. But um, it's kind of hard. If you have something that's a kilometer across and a couple of meters up, if you put uh, a rise, if you put a blanket of dust two inches thick on it, it you're not going to see it here. It's like you put a wet napkin over this surface, it's going to disappear. So, uh, but if you try to date that, yeah, it's all it's going to be recent. That's the main reason I feel there's so many recent dates for Carolina Bays, is all they're looking at is a reworked sand and and, uh, and there are dunes in a lot of these places you can clearly see these are sand dune type structures. Um, yeah, they're going to be there. If these are 800,000 years old, you can expect that they've been reworked and resurfaced uh, with a lot of stuff that came in through the air and landed on this surface. I think they're bubbles. I view that this, this wave comes in, lays all the sediment down, it's hot, it's full of water vapor. Uh, as it cools and the bubbles burst, you basically got these little, uh, these these little uh, ghost images. And, and I, when I first did this 25, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I was cognizant of it already, and you may already be. If you paint a wall and have splatters on the wall of the paint, and you let it dry, and you go back over and look at it, and it's a it the center of it dries out. Uh, so it flattens down. It's no longer a bump, but you'll get like a little rim around it. And if you try to sand that off, you can sand that away and there'll still be a little ghost image of where the outline of that was. And that's what I feel these are, just a simple ghost image of where the bubbles were. Now, that's a crazy idea, but so is the fact that continents go crashing through the ocean. So, um, so that's the story I'm using. The problem I have with either Mr. Carlson's or Mr. Zamora's work, uh, especially Mr. Z Mazur, Zamora's work, who, who I freely allow all this to be used, but he, he, you know, he, he uses my imagery a, a great deal. Uh, usually does um, say it's coming from Sintos, um, which is my gnome de plume here, Sintos.org. My elevation mapping, when you're looking at it this way, in and the, the way I create the imagery, I do a what's called a 20x exaggeration of elevation when it comes to applying something called hill shading. And hill shading is the fact that I've turned this area dark 
because the sun was coming in from the northeast, coming across and casting a shadow here. If I took off hill shading, this entire area would probably be about the same shade of green and you wouldn't see any of these furrows that are basically furrows that the farmer has in the field because uh, this is a field. Um, and you probably see the furrows if I get rid of the, and you can kind of see them, these are the furrows. Uh, but they show up as dark lines because this is a ditch, a drainage ditch. But that shadow is put in there by the processing software. Uh, if I turn that back down to no hill shading or just uh, no elevation exaggeration, you would not see any of these structures with your eyes as raised. Uh, it wouldn't be visible. That's because across this thing, now this is almost two kilometers across. It's a huge structure. That rim is probably only a meter from here to the top of the rim, three feet. And um, I do this a lot. There's no road here. Let's see if we go to the road. So in other words, when people are seeing the LIDAR here, it might look like there's these big ridges, but in reality, it's been stretched kind of like if you're a photographer adjusting the contrast, so it looks a lot larger than it actually is in reality. Ex exactly, that's a that's a good analogy. I encourage your viewers to do this, to go into street view, and you can usually see, uh, you can sometimes you can perceive a little bit of rise in a road, um, but you know, there's nothing here. This 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 over here where these two mobile homes are, that's the rim, and it, I don't know, it's really crazy, but. You can almost perceive that the trunk of this tree is a little higher up than the the, the base of this telephone pole. I, it just, and you can see the ditch here and it goes up. So that's the rim here. Um, it's very, very subtle. Uh, you could probably see the rim right in this area here. Again, I, I have to say, I I'm, I'm too, spent too much time looking at that. But um, you can see the rim and the LIDAR, and then you can go investigate what that rim looks like on the ground, and you will be disappointed. And one place I have taken a look across uh, from 13, uh, across a road and found out that, you know, you could see the rim, but yeah, I, I doubled the vers vertical exaggeration so that, that it was visible in the, in the image. Uh, very hard to see them. Those cannot be impact structures. There is no way they were excavated by something hitting the ground there and blasting out the debris and leave that fine ghost rim. It just wouldn't happen. Not that fine. Uh, I call them berms because the berm here, I get rid of the uh, lidar on it. This is this is kind of a uh, important aspect of the paper in our in our justification for things. That berm runs typically, uh, it's the same up and down slope. It just runs as a berm as if it was poured by a concrete machine or by earth movers who were working on it. That berm, berm just stands up and runs and underneath my LIDAR, uh, underneath my template, you can see how it how finely it traces along that berm where, where it still exists. And then it'll come back around and pick it right back up again. So um, that's an aspect that I think justifies the fact that these cannot be impact craters. I know Zamora has his template where he says they come in at a certain angle and it creates a, a truncated cone conic section, but these all look exactly the same. And they are not ovals, by the way. Here on the Eastern shore, what I call the Bay, bay Shore thing is actually flattened on one side here. Why? I don't know, but you know, I've got a lot of ideas, but this match is better if it's flattened on this side than if it was a pure oval. And it shows up in, it shows up in, as you follow the trace across, you'll see this side's gotten flattened. And then you pick up back out here going around. Um, so those aspects of it, there's about 800 bays that have that flattened shape on it there. Um, there's 12,000, 25,000 bays that have the Bay Carolina shape. And it's about 25,000 that have the Bay South shape, which is more of a teardrop. That shape is so robustly replicated over and over and over again, all the way from the shore, all the way to 200 meters above sea level. And I don't believe that's just because the impactors all came in at that same angle, all 25,000 of those. Um, it's not possible. It, it's far more, 
but anyhow, it's not possible because he still needs to excavate down. If you've got a one kilometer diameter crater, you should be going down at least 300 meters or more to excavate a typical crater. And 300 meters down on the coast would, they didn't all fill back in again. He says viscous relaxation, it all flowed back in again, but uh, flowing back in again, it's gonna bring the rims in together too. So uh, I'm comfortable with that. And I'm comfortable with the fact that the sonic, the sonic blasting thing, same issue. Uh, comet comes in, it's gonna hit a one area, you know, maybe three kilometers in diameter. How did it get the entire East Coast involved, engaged in that? Were there 50 comets coming in all at the same time? Uh, all of the same size and all doing the same blast damage? Um, well, that would be my question again, is that what if you did have, not all at the same time, but over, again, if we start with the 800,000 year event, and then you have one happening 13,000 years ago, coming in the same t trajectory, and then you essentially can stack them and eventually fill up the whole area, but speculative to be sure. Right, and and actually the solution to that uh, is the same solution that I put forward as the falsification. The falsification put forward is that if you go into the sands that are anomalous on these surfaces, that they shouldn't be there, that if you go look at their burial dating of the surfaces underneath them, uh, if it shows that all the sand on this entire footprint and sand and gravel and silt and clay, whatever, whatever it is today, uh, if it arrived there at 788,000 years ago and, and the beryllium aluminum dating will go back pretty accurately back to 5 million years, unlike OSL, which only goes to about 200,000 years and carbon only goes to 50,000 years, that goes back 5 million years and they can find exactly when that sand wound up on that surface. And I'm pragmatic enough to recognize that one or two or five locations that show 800,000 ago, years ago is not gonna prove it. Uh, the same is for you. I mean, your, your premise, you'd need a thousand of one date and a thousand of the other date showing that they all arrived, that, that they were all created at that time. But if they were all created 780,000 years ago or 800,000 years ago, as it were, uh, rough estimate. Um, that is what our falsification principle is. And um, so there are a lot of other solutions, Peter, and, and, and I agree with you. One of the solutions to the, to the dating quagmire is that, that there were multiple events, but I'm, my premise is just because they're looking at surficial, uh, just the, 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 the people from Savannah River uh, Ecology Center, um, which is on the Savannah River plant um, in um, South Carolina, which is this area here is very dense. And the beauty of that is that, and you can actually see it here. Um, this here is called eminent domain. See that hole in the middle of the picture here? That is, a, that is US Department of Defense where they build all, they design and, and manufacture all their uranium. That's what this road work. Back in the fifties, they took everybody from this area and moved them. <laughs> move them cities put everybody out here not just along a river bank this entire circle was empty to people and they built their plants in here but the beauty of it is that for the last 70 years they haven't been destroying the bays so the bays here are, are really kind of nice because they haven't been farmed or anything so that they, they last really nice uh, and there's been a lot of work on here and the reason that they've done a lot of work at the savannah river ecology group is because on the rims of these Carolina bays uh, are found Paleo-Indian remains from 10,000 years ago. Why? Because 10,000 years ago, the Indians used to hunt on these Carolina bays and build their campsites and fished in them and, and hunted game in them. And if you look at their OSL dates and their sampling technique, they go down one meter and a half meter down, they find the Indian stuff. And then they go another half meter to make sure they haven't missed anything and then they stop. And that's all they date. They date the top surficial sediments on this area that already we know has been covered with a half meter of loose and windblown deposits on top of the old campsites. 
They're not finding these 10,000 year old remains at the surface. So all they are ever measuring is the superficial deposits. When they go down deeper, the problems they run into is they become, the OSL doesn't give them a date. So what can they say? It's older than 200,000 years. And then they leave it at that. It could be 800,000 years. They just have no way of probing that. Um, but I'm hoping that some of them with the paper and the motivation for it to go back to places where they have done those kind of cores and go down, look at 10 meters down and see if they can find a, a sedimentary where there is a contact between uh, sediments that show that the top sediments were all buried, were all delivered 800,000 years ago. Yeah. Have you seen the, I think George Howard has a video or two where he's digging in some of the Carolina bays and they have a, a pretty thick layer of clay at the bottom. Have you seen that? Yes. Um, Carolina bays and and also the, the High Plains playas, because of their, again, the dating would help. Imagine that you know, take take a leap of faith and imagine that this space in here is 800,000 years ago. Over eight glacial cycles, hot and cold, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, what weather will bring you. This has captured every piece of precipitation that fallen into it and every piece of dust that fell into it. It's probably all still in here someplace. And all the fines that come in, the fines being the dust, the finest of the dust, basically percolates through the sand and it the, the geologists have a term for it basically all those fine sediments percolate down they get washed down through the coarser sediments and they settle at the top of the water table and at that top of the water table you get a line of clay and that starts building up and up and up and then eventually which is the case of every one of these that is still hydraulically closed they get what they call an aquitard meaning it's water retentive the water can't seep through it anymore and because the water can't seep through it anymore the clay even builds up more and more and more because it can't continue to wash it down through some of these places there's two kilometers of sediment underneath this stuff uh since the quaternary since the uh, cretaceous so this the sediment can't so it builds up a layer of clay so underneath all these carolina bays are significant layers of clay on a ecological note out in the High Plains Playas, you may be aware of the fact that your listeners may be aware of the fact that the High Plains player is host to the High Plains Aquifer, the Aladala Aquifer, that they think has been reduced to like 20% or 30% of what it was 100 years ago because of people pumping out of it. Well, one of the problems is that they now they've figured out that because of the density of the playas, that 90% of the water in the Aladala Aquifer got there by being captured in a closed hydraulic basin, which was the playa, and seeping down into the, through the, through the, uh, the hard sandstone bedrocks, seeping down and filling up the aquifer. Since it turned into farming, and there's all this dust being raised up, including the dust bowl, these center part of the playas are becoming clogged with clay. They're not allowing the water to seep down. So they're trying to go through and they're only doing it. They're doing it slowly, but there's like, I think they think there's 80,000 playas and they got like 155 of them done last year. They go in and they dig out all the clay and allow any water captured in that area to seep down into the aquifer. And they're hoping that eventually they may start actually recharging the aquifer. Here on the East Coast, uh, I mentioned North Carolina was one of the first places to do an awful lot of uh, uh, LIDAR work and their concern was the fact they were getting an awful lot of flooding in these lowlands. And I propose that uh, the flooding in the lowlands is coming because every single one of these Carolina bays in areas of high density, uh, when you had a hurricane come through, they captured 80% of the precipitation and kept it held in these Carolina bays for weeks or months until it slowly drained out. So you take this footprint here right now and put a foot of water in it. Every single bit of that foot of water is going to come out of all these channels. These are all been trenched. An awful lot of these have been trenched out. So the water that goes right to the river basin and it floods far more than it did 100 years ago or 200 years ago. That's why we're getting so much flooding because the, the water's not staying in the basin. It's it's finding its way out to the uh, other than that. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of hard to find them that haven't been trenched. This is one thing I also say about 
and, and I've he heard this come back at me from some other geologists, these things are so shallow and the rims are so small, so low, the, the rims are so low. If these actually were holding water and that's how they were formed, why didn't they just simply drain out? It, it only takes about three meters of trench to make them drain out. Why did they all continue to hold water instead of just automatically create their own drainage out to the to the rivers? It doesn't take much to drain one of these things. Yeah, I know. I was recently reading a book from the Comet Research Group they released back in like 2006. And one of the things that stood out to me in the book was that they had the guy going out looking for the Carolina Bays and he couldn't see him. He'd drive right past him and he's like, where is it? which is what you were talking about earlier, where the rims are so small that unless you know where to look for, even then you might not see them. And that's something you have to keep in mind. I guess the, the one thing I wanted to touch on too was uh, I had mentioned the, the, the Highlands playas. And then of course, the other part of the triangulation of getting to Saginaw Bay was, was the basins up in Nebraska. And they, again, look a little different, but they are pretty well oriented and they are reproducible. But the one thing that we do know about these things is that these were about 20 years ago investigated by uh, William Zanner and his, uh, his uh, associate, Kozilla. And Kozilla went out and dug across two of these basins, and he was looking to try to sense you know, what they were created on. And he did some nice transects back and forth across a couple of these basins. And he put out a paper about how what we see at the surface today is inherited from a ovoid landform that's down 10 meters. Below what is on the surface here is up to 10 meters of glacial lust that's come in in the last 800,000 years off of these rivers. Uh, so these rivers, uh, after the glacial ice ages, especially the, the Platte River system here too, this created an awful lot of fine dust and the fine dust spread across here and blanketed this whole area with up to 10 meters of this lus, uh, which shows up a lot. But his, his description, and he never did figure out when he got down there, he said they were even more crisply defined under this blanket than we see at the surface today. But the, the basin is below this on another surface. Uh, he went down to it. I actually talked to him once and said, well, are you going to, now that we have beryllium aluminum dating, have you gone down to that level? And can you figure out when that debris that created those rims were created? And he said, well, I'm retired now and I'll leave that to somebody else to do. But um, it's another place to go do beryllium aluminum dating is go back and revisit these things and say, uh, we know when the losses arrived. They're they're datable with OSL uh, because uh, because they're from the late Laurentide and and uh, Wisconsin glaciations. Uh, but going back two and a half million years, we've been getting we've been getting uh, glacial ice ages for two and a half million years. It'd be interesting to find out when these rims were first formed that are being shown at the surface. And again. If you take something that's two kilometers across and you put 10 meters of glacial dust on top of it, it blanket it over it, it's, it, it's going to still, it's still going to be there. These basins are still going to be here uh, and they're going to continue to project up just as they do here. So in other words, what you're saying is that these uh, Nebraska rainwater basins had to have formed before all that lust was deposited, correct? Right, right, exactly. And, and this was... You know, uh, this was a stumbling block for Mike Davius back when I was looking at 40,000 years or something. I said, well, wait a minute. Now, they know when all these, they've got a name for them, all these different lost layers from uh, the Wisconsin and the, they call it the penultimate glaciation at uh, 100,000 years ago. And there's a name for the glaciation for 200,000 years ago. And they know when this lust arrived because they can date it uh, through pollen and things like that. Um, these formations that I'm looking for don't have any pollen in them because they were all formed catastrophically at one chunk. So it, that is another proof point that they were catastrophic. Um, although the proof point is lost on people who say that there's no fossils in it, they just say, well, that's this kind of sediment that has no fossils in it. Well, what kind of sediment doesn't have fossils in it? Some sort of fossils. I mean, there should be something. 
especially if these are basins filling with water and they're kind of like swampy over in North Carolina, you'd think there'd be plenty of things living in there, right? Yeah. Well, that brings up another thing, Peter, and that is that I was really excited because I heard that one of these big bays in the Cape Fear River Valley, they had gone out there and they did some coring in it and they went down and found the bottom sand uh, and, and dated the sand at the bottom. They went down and cored through the muck and thing and came into a layer of sand and they dated that. And it was like 14,000 years ago. I says, well, how far down did you go? Oh, about a 1,200 centimeters, about 120 centimeters. I said, what do you mean you went down 120 centimeters? You probably get 120 centimeters centimeters of sediment flowing into that basin every 100,000 years. I mean, what, did you go down 10 feet, 10 meters, uh, find you know other layers of the same thing? Peak moss and covered with sand, peak moss covered with sand. I mean, that that's what you should be expecting in those because that floodplain, you know, flooded over and filled up with debris during flooding periods and then drained back out again. And then the rims just represent themselves because all they did is put a blanket in them. But you're not going to find the bottom of the basin unless you dig a lot further down. Again, the idea of the paper is to motivate geologists to get out their coring equipment and don't stop at the water table, you know, do geocores. Uh, you use a backhoe like George Howard and I was attending one of his uh, sessions in North Carolina where we, we dug through a rim, but we we're high enough up on the rim and he, we did dig uh, eight meters down through the rim and it was all sand, just homogeneous sand all the way down till we got to clay. But in that place, the clay was pretty well known. It's a kind of orangish red clay. It's from the Cretaceous. That's the Cretaceous clay that was on the surface back 800,000 years ago in my proposal. So that's another solution to the clay that you find at the bottom of the bays is that's, that that is the antecedent surface. And those clays are very easy to recognize under a microscope because they have all the right fossils in them to show what age that, that was formed. Um, it's just the stuff above it, and I'll toss the term out, the final term I'll use on you is post-Miocene. You go across the literature, it's full of post-Miocene sediments on the coastal plains, because they're sediments that they can't date because of all these reasons, but they are obviously younger than the sediments that are below them, and can't argue with that. Uh, stratigraphically, they're obviously younger than those sediments, but, and they're older than OSL or carbon dating can date. So they just put them into the big bucket of three and a half million years ago to 200,000 years ago, someplace in there. And my proposal is if we actually date it all, it's all going to fall 800,000 years ago, and then they'll have a conundrum. How did it all get there 800,000 years ago? Well, I want to thank you for coming on, Michael. I think that's going to be a very interesting topic for people that might be still new to the idea of the Carolina Bays. And uh, if people want to learn more about your hypothesis and check out the LIDAR data, they can find that on your website, Sintos, correct? And I'll have a link for all this in the description. I have a couple of them to look at bays. I think I've given you those links. So uh, other ways of looking at the bays with, with uh, like SOAR and and some websites I built to just look at individual bays. Um, that's all there. Uh, but most important is the paper. Uh, and it is $9.99, nine, $9 but I think for 30 pages is cheap. And Tim and I uh, have agreed with the GSA that we're not going to distribute that thing uh, openly, at least for another year, uh, because we want them to be repaid for their all their efforts in assembling that. 30 page paper. It was quite a bit of effort on their part. And I'll have a link for that paper as well if people want to look into that. So, yeah, thanks for coming on, Mike, and uh, look forward to maybe talking to you again at some point. Same here. And keep your, keep your IDs going forward too, because I, <laughs> this is something we just don't have an answer to. Right. I think that's a great place to end it because what we've seen today is that the Carolina Bays, essentially, our modern civilization has built right on top of them without even realizing it in many cases. And I think that's just a great way to understand that our planet is constantly being, I guess you could say, assaulted from outer space, whether that's the sun or comets or asteroids, anything else. And I think that's something that we're going to have to deal with sooner or later as a species is how do we defend ourselves against these threats. But 
we'll save that for another video. So thanks for watching. Thanks for coming on, Michael. And uh, I'll see you guys in another video.